Hi guys, I'm back again today with the last part of the Sira. So, um, yeah, let's go straight into the video. And to, yes, I did get sleep. Finally. So, hear me out. I don't know what time I passed out, but like, my eyes was like, uh, I was able to stay awake till, I don't know, maybe 8, 9, 10, around those times. And then I woke up at 9 a.m. So you can say, let's just say I slept at 11 because I don't remember <laughs> the night, okay? I do not remember. Uh, I was editing and then my eyes just closed. So I woke up, it was 9. So that's all I remember. <laughs> um, so let's say 8, 9, 10 hours, somewhere there. So I'm good, okay? I'm alive. I'm awake. So we're gonna do this. Before we start, don't forget to subscribe, click the bell button. Let's get it. Al Man Al Farsi did not uh, accept Islam for a few years. He didn't accept Islam right at the Hijra. It took him a few years to accept Islam, and then the Mu'akha took place. We also have, for example, Jafar ibn Abi Talib was made a brother of Mu'adh ibn Jabal. When did Jafar come to Medina? I already mentioned this. Who can tell me? Obviously after Habsha, but when? <laughs> seventh year of the Hijrah, right? So in the seventh year of the Hijrah, Ja'far comes back and still the Prophet makes Mu'akha. It is also mentioned, for example, that Mu'awiyah ibn Abi Sufyan was made a brother with Hattat al taymi and Mu'awiyah accepted Islam after fath Makkah. So this shows us that the concept of pairing people together was not something that was unique only to the beginning of Islam. It lasted throughout the entire course of the Madani phase, and therefore, from this we extract that this is a neglected sunnah. Up until our times, we should be doing this, especially when people convert to Islam. Especially when people convert to Islam, this is a necessary sunnah we need to resurrect. Because that's the whole point. I mean, what is the purpose of having mu'akha? A stranger comes to town. He doesn't know even how to get around. He doesn't know the ins and outs of the city. A, a convert comes, he doesn't even know the social life of a Muslim. He doesn't even know how to pray and fast. He needs not just social company, he needs support. He needs emotional and physical support. He needs somebody to just sit down and tell him what to do. And wallahi, this is something that we need to resurrect in our times. That we need to pair together. We should have families adopt, let's say, you know, meaning it's less, this type of adoption, right? We should have families or people just volunteer and say, okay, uh, this is going to be my, if you're like, I'm going to take this as my akhi or my ukhti, right? The sister should adopt, the, the sister converse and vice versa. It should be done because it's something that the Prophet ﷺ continued to do throughout his life. Up until the very end, even after Fatih Makkah, which shows it wasn't something that was temporary, and it is something that we should also think about as a uh, community. It also shows that some of the benefits we get from this issue of, uh, of Mu'akha. It really shows that for any society to grow, to develop, there needs to be strong bonds cemented between them. And we believe that there are no bonds that are stronger than the bonds of religion. These are the strongest bonds because the people of a religion, they share many things in common that really define a lot of things. Most importantly, your ethics and your values. Most importantly, your outlook on life, right? That is shared by the people of one religion. The way you view the world is shaped by your religion. So uh, we believe, therefore, that these bonds are something that should be uh, strengthened and should be, in fact, the Quran tells us that this is the strongest bond. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً Right? This is the strongest of all bonds. And when you look at this early society of Muslims, no society in the history of mankind has been as selfless, as generous to strangers as this group of people. Think about it, right? Even blood brothers would not do for their blood brothers what the Ansar did for the Muhajirun. Isn't this true? I mean, think about the stories that we just heard now. Even blood brothers would not do this. But the Ansar did it and Allah praised them from above the seven heavens by saying they did it genuinely from the heart. It's one thing to do it and Allah says their hearts were pure when they did it. 
Never in the history of humanity have we found this type of example of selflessness, of genuinely giving for the sake of the other and not for the sake of yourself. And it is impossible for any society to achieve such standards without having these bonds. And that's what the Prophet established as soon as he moved to uh, Medina. Also realize that uh, one of the things we learn is that the true leader, the Prophet in this case, cannot just give general advice and leave it at that. Rather, the Prophet implemented this decision. How so? By choosing the two people one after the other. Because he knew each one of the Muhajirun better than anybody else. And so he knows who is the most qualified to be the brother of this particular Muhajir. And therefore the real leader is not just theory, he's also practice. The real leader isn't just talk, he's also action. And the Prophet literally sat down, and Sayyidina Malik says, I forgot to mention this, that he did this pact or this mu'akha in our house. What does it mean, our house? Scholars say, uh, probably Anas meant in his area of Medina, Fidarina, meaning in our area of Medina, because he didn't have the masjid. And so Anas ibn Malik is saying he did this mu'akha in our area of Medina, which means he literally sat down and one after the other people are coming and he's pairing people uh, together. And this shows us that the Prophet was a very uh, practical, a pragmatic visionary, not just uh, somebody talking theoretically. Uh, it also shows us the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in gradually formulating the laws of the Sharia. Ah. The Sharia, ah, as we all know, came down bit by bit. It didn't just come down all together. And this is one more example that in the beginning, when the Muhajirun don't have any family at all, the Ansar becomes literally family. And there's only even going to be inheritance between the two. Then what happens? Allah Azza wa Jal makes it easier. And once more and more people convert and they have genuine family, the Muhajirun get married and they have their own kids now, right? Slowly but surely they have family. Now Allah Azza wa Jal changes the laws of inheritance and it is now what we know as the laws of inheritance. Therefore, for that generation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed that generation to experience the Sharia ah in a gradual, in a piecemeal manner. We all know the prohibition of wine didn't come down overnight. It came down in four different segments four different bit by bit, it took a while to get them to the prohibition. Question, if a convert comes and says, why can't I use this four step program to give up alcohol? Why don't you allow me a little bit at a time? Give me one year for each of these, like in those days, right? Hmm? If somebody were to say this, why can't we do it? Or is it even allowed to do this? The response is by unanimous consensus of all the scholars of Islam, there is no difference of opinion, that a new convert is not allowed the uh, privileges that those Sahaba had. Why? One simple reason. The Sahaba were the first society of Muslims. They have no role model. They have no support. It's going to take a while for them to get to the level of perfection. When a convert converts to Islam, he has a society already up and running. He has a community already exemplifying the Sharia. Ah. And therefore, you cannot give him the laxities that the first generation had. Right? And therefore, we will say to this uh, person, thanks but no thanks, it's a nice question you have and mashallah you're going to become a faqih, it looks like for that question, you're really going deep into the sharia, ah, you know usul al-fiqh, you're going to start maneuvering your way, but uh, you're not going to be given this concession, you are required, uh, yani so much so that we know that uh, the convert technically should start praying immediately, even if he doesn't know Fatiha. He will just say it in English or he will hold it in his hand. Whatever he needs to do to get by, but he needs to start praying immediately, right? Even if he's forgiven for the details that he doesn't actually know. Subhanahu Rabbi al he can hold it or he can say it in English. You know, all praise be to God. Whatever he needs to to get by until he memorizes. But technically all of the laws of Islam come. Now of course it's a different story that we as a community are wise in, you know, gradually telling him what to do. but. Technically, the Sharia ah is applicable upon him instantaneously at his uh, conversion. Other uh, wisdoms that, other wisdoms that we uh, benefit from over here. Uh, of course, needless to say, we already said this last week. Uh, the status of the Ansar, the status of this group of people whom Allah Azza wa Jal praises in the Quran in multiple verses, and that is why loving the Ansar is a sign of faith and iman. 
Hadith in Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, the Prophet said that Ayatul Imani Hubbul Ansar. The sign of Iman is to love the Ansar. Wa Ayatul Nifaq Bughdul Ansar. And a sign of hypocrisy is to hate the Ansar. It's a hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, right? And uh, therefore, anybody who loves the Ansar, this is a sign of Iman. And anybody who hates the Ansar, our Prophet ﷺ has said something else about them. And in fact, so much is the blessings of the Ansar, the Prophet ﷺ even said to them that if I could, I would give up my lineage and be a part of you. When did he say this? After the Fatih Makkah. And he said, لَوْلَ الْهِجْرَ لَكُنْتُمْ رَأَنْ مِنَ الْأَنْصَارِ Were it not for the Hijrah, I would have considered myself one of the Ansar. I can't change biologically that I'm Qurashi. Mm. I cannot change that I'm from Mecca. Were it not for the fact that I come from Mecca, I would have considered myself one of the Ansar. وَلَوْ سَلَكَ النَّاسُ وَادِيًا وَسَلَكَ الْأَنصَارُ وَادِيًا لَسَلَكْتُ وَادِ الْأَنصَارِ If all of mankind went in one direction, and the Ansar went in another direction, I would choose the direction of the Ansar. This is what the Prophet is saying. The, the amount of praise he gave to the Ansar, and these are in our Bukhari Muslim textbooks, not in some obscure. These are like the standard books of our faith, right? The amount of praise he gave to the Ansar is in, indeed unprecedented, even though the Muhajirun have a degree above them, subhanAllah, right? Even though the Muhajirun have a degree above them, and that is why whenever Allah praises the Ansar, subhanAllah, every time he praises the Muhajirun before them. Every time. Allah says in the Quran, uh, that was sabiqun al-awwaluna min al-muhajirina wal-ansar. The first peoples to embrace Islam from the muhajirin and the ansar. He begins with the muhajirin, then the ansar. لَقَدْ تَابَ اللَّهُ عَلَى النَّبِيِّ وَالْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ Allah has repented upon the Prophet and the muhajirin and the ansar. Again, the muhajirin before the ansar. SubhanAllah, even in the ayah that Allah praises the, muhaj, the, the, the ansar, and that is Allah, the, the saying of Allah, وَالَّذِينَ تَبَوَّءُ الدَّارَ وَالْإِيمَانِ This is the highest praise of the ansar in the Quran, Surah Al-Hashr verse 9. Right? Uh, those who prepared the house, that's the praise of the Ansar. The verse right before it mentions, Lil Fuqara il Muhajirin. The verse right before it. And so Allah Azza wa Jal always gave precedence to the Muhajirun over the Ansar. And if the Ansar have been praised in such a high manner, where does that leave the uh, Muhajirun? And that is why uh, when the Ansar were praised so highly, that is why the Sahaba, the, the, the Muhajirun, became so scared that they might take our rewards. Ya Rasulullah, is, are they going to take our rewards? And the Prophet said, no, they will not take your rewards as long as you continue to praise them and make dua uh, for them. Uh, so this is the issue of the Mu'akha. Inshallah, we'll uh, stop here, open the floor for Q&A. And next Wednesday, Inshallah, we will begin talking about a very significant portion of the seerah, Talks a very, very important uh, portion of the seerah, and that is... Uh, the constitution of Medina, which is a, uh, a novel idea, which was unprecedented in Arabia. Some even say unprecedented in the world, uh, in its scope, in its uh, guarantee for freedom of religion. And this is really absolutely true. The way that the Prophet ﷺ formulated the state, the Madani state, that he allowed the Yahud, he allowed the Muslims to do this, he allowed, he mentions the Mushrikeen as well in this contract, the amount of freedom that was given and the type of republic that the Prophet ﷺ brought forth in Medina, some have even said it is completely unprecedented in, in, in human history. And we'll talk about uh, the concept of this constitution and the importance of the constitution and also some of the controversies over this uh, constitution or treaty of Medina. Inshallah, that will be next uh, Wednesday. Also, before I forget, also the announcement. Uh, I was I told to make two announcements before I open the floor for Q&A. The first announcement uh, on Saturday evening at 7 p.m. 7 p.m., right? Over here. At 7 p.m., uh, we will be doing a... Uh, what is the title of it? Was it huh? A bonfire event. Uh, and uh, it will be done here on our grounds at MIC. Uh, halal marshmallows, inshallah, uh, will be arranged, don't worry. Uh, and uh, I have been asked to give a talk, so I will be talking about uh, signs of the Day of Judgment. Signs of the Day of Judgment we'll be talking about, uh, inshallah, at 7 p.m. on Saturday. Uh, also, Saturday, this is done, is this Saturday? Saturday or Sunday? I thought it was, you emailed Saturday. No, the Hacienda. 
Sunday. Sunday? Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, on Sunday, uh, all day long from 11 a.m. up until 10 p.m. All day long Sunday, uh, we are having our second Zabiha uh, day because we made the mistake of having Zabiha night. And mashallah, we had like 200 people in the restaurant. So uh, 300 people. Uh, by the way, we forgot to announce, but the manager of the Chinese restaurant uh, profusely apologized. He said he was expecting 30, not 300. Uh, and so next time he will be prepared. He said, next time you do it, I will have triple the amount. He told me this myself. He said, triple the amount of uh, staff and, uh, and, and cooks. He apologized profusely. I guess it was uh, our problem as well that we didn't know what to expect. And so he thought 30 people would be coming, so he didn't have the quantity of chefs and people. So those of you who went, you know, it was a long line, but mashallah, the food was worth it, I would say, alhamdulillah. Um, so this time, uh, the manager, the restaurant manager has basically given us the entire day. So we can take our time, whoever wants to go for lunch, whoever wants to go for late lunch, early dinner, late dinner, the entire day the restaurant will be serving Zabiha. Uh, and this is La Hacienda, but not the La Hacienda that I thought it was, which is in downtown. This is the La Hacienda on Forest Hill, Irene, and Germantown. Sorry, the La Hacienda, Forest Hill, Irene, and Poplar. Yeah, Forest Hill, Irene, and Poplar. The Mexican La Hacienda restaurant will be serving uh, Zabiha all day, so you don't even have to ask for Zabiha, right? It's just, no, you have to ask. Oh, you have to ask for it? It's open to the general public. Okay, so you have to tell your waiter you want the, the Zabiha. So they'll be cooking Zabiha uh, separate, and I thought it was all of it. Okay, so that's the second announcement. With that, we open the floor for questions. Oh, third announcement. Yalla, bismillah. Live blood ATF, we need to give a few minutes, so it's about the blood. Okay, so we take two, three questions, and inshallah, we'll do that. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Uh, you said that the Mu'akhab should be uh, re-instantiated. Uh, I was wondering, did any of the Sahaba after Rasulullah passed away, did any of them uh, implement the Mu'akhab? The scholars say there was no need for them to do so. But we in our times are at a time of... Uh, there is no up and running society. We are more in this need of Mu'akhab because the society around us is not the up and running society of Medina. So. And that, we, I don't know of any type of mu'akha that was done at the time of the Sahaba. Uh, Allahu A'lam. So, the second question is regarding the uh, uh, suggestion to converts that they begin to pray in their native tongue. Uh, and I was wondering if you would make uh, that a general rule for people who... Okay, before we continue, I feel like the mu uh, mu'akha is going to be a good... Thing to practice in this day and age in terms of like reverts like okay somebody who knows the faith and then a revert pair together so that like you know it's gonna be easy uh, for the revert of course so that's my two cents don't speak Arabic even maybe children when they begin to learn no, no, we don't, we don't make this a general rule at all. None of the scholars ever made this a general rule. As for converts praying in their tongue, this is something that classical books of fiqh have mentioned. That what do you expect, if somebody takes the shahada right now, how do you expect him to pray Isha with us? And it's not even possible for him to read Fatiha. So what's he going to do? Well, either he doesn't pray, which doesn't make sense, or he prays and we just tell him, say whatever you can. So much so that if he doesn't even know Fatiha, he just says, praise be to God. Praise be to God. That's fine. He'll be forgiven until he can learn Arabic. The same cannot be said of us who are Muslims or our children who are born into our households. We teach them the Fatiha in Arabic. We teach them the, the rituals in Arabic. Uh, our Salah must be performed in Arabic. The Quran and the Adhkar of Salah. None of the scholars of Islam ever allowed uh, them to be perform, performed in any other language. How about dua? You make, you... The dua may be done in any language. The dua may be done in any language. Question from the sisters. Even in Fard. Even in, we went over this long time with the sisters in their fiqh class. Yes, even in Fard. Yes, go ahead. So uh, the sacred months are. Uh, Shawwal, Dhul Qa'da, and Dhul Hijjah, and Rajab. Uh, sorry, uh, Dhul Qa'da, Dhul Hijjah, Muharram, and Rajab. Dhul Qa'da, Dhul Hijjah, Muharram, and Rajab. 
These are the sacred months. Rajab is the only one that's separate. Rajab is the only one that is separate. The other three are connected together. Uh, the Zawaj of Aisha took place. Uh, it is said the actual Aqd took place before uh, the Hijra, and then the Bina or the conservation took place after the Hijra. Okay, brothers, yes. Uh, the first one is calling the state of Islam Republic. is a word. Uh, in, a, in a way of a government that is, doesn't apply to Wallahi, to be honest, the word republic is vague, and it is, it is okay to call it a type of federation or republic. And when we talk about the constitution next week, uh, uh, when we talk about the, when we talk about, when we talk about the constitution of Medina next week, it is actually not incorrect to call it a type of republic. These terms, of course, can be defined differently. And uh, a republic is a type of state that it could apply. If you want to call it state, even the word state is not mentioned. These are all English terms. So uh, there's an expression in Arabic. Uh, there's, a, there's an expression in Arabic which you should be familiar with. La mushahata fil istalah. You know this phrase? La mushahata fil istalah. But there is no istalah for republic. Uh, that's the point. It's as we define it. حتى الدولة حتى إصطلاح الدولة هذا لم تذكر في الكتب القديمة حتى إصطلاح الدولة. Of course, this is something even which is modern, which so actually this is evidence against you. Second point. Second point. Uh, you mentioned that Salman Farisi was of old age, and that's an excuse for the hijab, which is. لا لا. I said two reasons, أخي. كن دقيق معي. One of them, I said, مشي الحال كان رجل عجوز في السن. Right. والله عند الشافعية عند الشافعية there is a قول عند الشافعية that there I'm is lost. a فرق between the, the one who has شهوة the one who has no شهوة and this is a قول but the more important one is that this was before the hijab third point بسم الله uh, the third point is about, about the gradualty of, uh, of uh, alcohol uh, um, Sharia in general did not come down in peace That is what I said, that it came down over piecemeal. That's what I said. It didn't come down in bulk, it came down gradually, bit by bit. So alcohol was not prohibited overnight, it was gradually prohibited. Sah? It was prohibited. And the last ayah, when it came down, it was not prohibited. I mean, I think, I think you're being a bit technical here. It wasn't prohibited overnight. In the beginning, Allah Azza wa Jal warned them against drinking. Then Allah warned them against certain timings of drinking. And then Allah Azza wa warned them against drinking, period. So I'm calling it gradually. Uh, and I mean, again, I think you're being a little bit technical here. The importance of this issue is not for that particular issue. Now we find Muslims that uh, won elections and, and they're, they're getting into government in some countries. They are asking for some relief of some uh, ayat and hadith. Some Muslims are now ruling in Egypt. They're saying uh, alcohol should be allowed in some areas. Wallahi, okay, this is a deep issue. We're raising kind of sort of, I think you're kind of sort of taking us all the way back there. We're over here in Memphis, Tennessee. Let's deal with our local issues, inshallah. Zakallah khair, Sheikh. I didn't say this, but I think your audience is in Egypt, so you should, you should uh, tell them that, inshallah. Final question before we give it over to our guests that are here. Any other questions? Yes, go ahead. 
Well, you said that, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu you know, matched everyone together very appropriately. How did he know the Ansar? I mean, he didn't know the people of Medina that well, so how did he know who was best suited to each other? Either we can say that uh, this was from Allah Azza wa Wahi, or we can say that he got the, the mashwara or the, the, the feedback from the people. Again, as with most instances of the seerah, for every one thing reported, there are 20 things that are unreported. You know, and this is the reality of any life. How much do you know? As I mentioned back in the first day of the seerah, I said, how much do you even know of your father's life, of your grandfather's life, right? Yani, for one incident, even that incident, how much details do you know? So if this is the case of people we have lived with, how about 14 centuries ago? These details are history books are silent about. Uh, so we have some... Yeah, but, but all 50 of them? I mean, this is a good question that even I ask myself, by the way. Like, uh, so some of them, of course, he would know, but all, all of the 50, and it's Allahu Alami, Imma Wahya, Imma Mashwara. So, Iqbal, if you can announce the. Wow. Well, I'm glad they're asking questions. Um, to make things clear to them and to everyone else, if they want to, uh, if they don't, if they don't know, but this was very interesting, a very interesting topic. Uh, topic. Um, I'm very excited for the next part because it's the constitution, right? If I'm not mistaken, yeah, the constitution of Medina. So that will be a fascinating one. It's more like, how do you call this? It's going to be very systematic. Is that the right word I'm looking for? I'm not sure. But anyways, I will see you in that part. Thank you guys for joining and I'll see you then. Bye.